Hello and welcome to the call. My name's Becky Murray and 10 years ago I founded a missions organisation called One by One. Well over the years I've watched God do different things as I've began to step out on the call of God on my life. And so I wanted to share certain principles that I've learned along the way so far, although I'm still on a huge journey of discovering God unfold more and more. And so I wanted to do this series to share with you, to encourage you on your call with God. Maybe your call's not about world missions. Well, don't worry, this whole show is not just about world missions, but it's the principles that God has in terms of following his plans and calling upon our life. And so stay with me, even if you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I don't think I'm called to the outbacks of Africa. That's fine, stay with me. Over the next few weeks together, we're gonna to look at different aspects. So last week we looked at how the call comes. Is it a case of there's writing on the wall or some booming voice from heaven? Or is it a case sometimes of the need is the call? Well, over the next few weeks, we're gonna look at even more areas. So as we step out on the call about the provision of God and how that comes and the wonders that he does when we just simply say yes to him. We're gonna look at the perseverance it takes when life can be challenging and it can be tempting to step back from the call when life's hard. We're gonna also look at what the pursuit of the call is upon our lives. But tonight, I wanna to look at what I've termed the preparation season of the call. I wanna look at how we actually step out. You see, it's all great when the call comes and we get that promise or we get that certain dream. We can acknowledge that stage and we're fine with that. And then we can all look forward to the fulfillment of that promise and we're all great with that. But somewhere along the way, there's a process and that can be the challenging stage. So I wanna look at that with you tonight. Now this is a live series and so I would love to not just talk at you but for you to participate in this with me. I'd love you to send me your testimonies or your comments. Maybe you've got some questions on the way of, well I think maybe I've heard God but I don't know or I think I've got this promise and dream but I don't know how to start. Well send them in, let me hear from you as I think if you're thinking it, there may be several other people who are having the same questions too. And so we look and look at those together. You can either email them in or you can text the number on the screen and we would love to hear from you and then address those questions further in the episode. Well, tonight I want to look at how we step out. How do we start? So today we get this exciting promise, this dream, this, this call from God. But what does tomorrow look like? How do we actually start? As I shared with you last week, the call of God came to me when I was 18 years old. And I knew that I knew that I knew that God had told me about a children's home. And I remember coming home and telling my whole world about it. And I think I thought this home would miraculously drop out of the sky. Or I think I thought I'd maybe get a phone call with someone asking me to take over a children's home. I don't really know what I expected, but I know I expected it to happen quicker than it did. I ended up going on what became a 13 year process of the, the, the gap between the call coming and the promise being fulfilled. It was 13 years. Now I would love to tell you, I was so patient in those 13 years that I embraced the process. But if I'm gonna be really honest, I was frustrated. I didn't always understand what that season was about. I was just wanting to get going. I wanted to run in what it was that I felt God had got for my life. I'm the type of person that tomorrow's too late. Let's get it done today. And so 13 years of waiting became quite a challenge for me. But actually now with the beauty of hindsight, I see that it was those 13 years that began to shape and mold me in a beautiful way. In those 13 years, I went on this beautiful journey with God. I think as a child growing up, I, I knew all about God. I'd given my heart to Christ when I was nine and I loved Jesus very much, but I was good at acknowledging him as my Lord and my master, but I wasn't so great at acknowledging him as my friend or the lover of my soul. And in that 13 year period, God began to take me on this incredible journey where he literally wooed my heart. And so that saying yes became easier. Now life can still be challenging and there's, there are moments where I feel I have to step out in a certain way and I think, oh, 
I don't want to do this, or this is hard, or this is challenging. But actually, saying yes to him becomes easier when he absolutely just woos your heart. When you fall in love with Jesus, all the no's, the could nots, the should nots, all the excuses begin to fall away because in light of him, what is with, worth withholding? And so saying yes to God is the best thing we can ever do, both in terms of salvation, but then also in terms of following him with our life. Well, I want to look with you this evening at a few people in the Bible who also had to go on what I've called the preparation stage where they received a promise, but it didn't initially happen immediately. The first one that springs to mind for me is Abraham. Abraham receives this promise about, about a promised child and he knows that it's God. There's no ifs, there's no buts. He knows God's spoken. There's a promised child. And for him and Sarah, this was amazing. They were both already quite old in age. And yet this promise comes and it delights their heart. The problem was year after year begins to pass. And all of a sudden this exciting promise is, is looking less and less likely because continually time's passing and nothing appearingly is happening. And so they did what a lot of people do. They thought they had man's wisdom and thought they could help God. And so Sarah came up with this master plan of, okay, well, maybe this child is going to happen through my servant, Hagar. And so she has her husband to go with her servant. And when the servant becomes pregnant, the very thing Sarah thought she wanted suddenly created a great pain in her heart. And the challenge sometimes is when we've got this promise or this dream from God, we, we're so eager to get going in it that we want to make it happen. We want to force it to happen in our own wisdom. It's almost like we try to help God out of, well, God, you know, you're not, you're not quite there yet, so let me help you. Let me give you suggestions on how you need to do this. And that's exactly what Sarah and Abraham did. And I remember as I read that while I was holding on to my dream and my promise of a children's home, I remember praying, okay, God, please allow me, help me to wait for my Isaac because I know Isaac's coming, but in the meantime, it's so tempting to try and help God out and we end up creating Ishmael's in our life. And for Sarah and Abraham, if they'd have held fast to the promise, the intended child was always Isaac. And Isaac did come because with God's promises, they yes and amen while ever we're walking in obedience to him. But because they tried to help him out, they created an Ishmael. And I want to tell you, sometimes it takes more faith to wait on God and his timing for him to bring it to pass in the way he longs to bring it to pass, rather than us helping him out and creating Ishmael's along the way. Secondly, I think of Joseph. Joseph's this 17 year old who has this dreams of incredible power and influence that God's got for his life. And yet by the age of 30, he's now the prime minister. But from the age of 30, uh, 17 to the age of 30, Joseph went on a very interesting journey. And that journey took him into a pit and then the pit took him into slavery and the slavery took him into prison. In that day and age, a slave and a prisoner had no human rights whatsoever. And I must admit, for Joseph, when he was walking through those years, again, it was a 13-year period for Joseph too, I'm sure in those years of going through the pit and going th into slavery and then into a prison, I'm sure Joseph sat there days thinking, this is not what the dream looked like. God, this is not what was supposed to happen in my life. I thought you said, God, that you was gonna give me this prominent position of influence. And yet here I am in a position where I've got no human rights. I've got no influence whatsoever. And yet through his 13 years, Joseph was being shaped. He was being molded in his character. I believe God will spend years working on our character in order that we can really hold the gift that he's got for us to carry. And Joseph, through those 13 years, went on this journey where all the pride and all the arrogance was stripped away from him as he had to follow on a quite a difficult path. But that very difficult path, the very thing that he probably was trying to rebuke, was the very thing that led him to be in the right place at the right time so they indeed was able to become the prime minister of Egypt. I think sometimes that's the challenge of we get this promise or we get this dream, but then as life unfolds, the opposite seems to happen. And, and sometimes you're left there thinking, God, 
it wasn't supposed to go this way. What's going on? But when we trust him, when we, again, don't force it to happen in our way, but we trust God with what he's got, then it begins to unfold exactly perfectly. His sovereign plans come to pass. And with Joseph, we watch him go on this incredible journey where from a teenager with all his arrogance and all his pride, he's suddenly shaped and molded until he can be this mature man capable of leading a nation. And I guess that for me is one of the main challenges with Joseph. But the second thing I see when I read this account was be careful who you share your dreams with. Joseph shared his dream of this power and influence with the very people who he believed was bowing down to him in the dream. Maybe that wasn't quite his wisest moment. Maybe that screams the fact that he was 17 years old. But he shared it with the exact people, and those people, quite understandably, resented him from that point on. And his brothers suddenly had this attitude of jealousy and anger towards him. We need to be careful who we share our dreams and promises with. Make sure you do share the dream. It's important. Maybe if God's given you a promise, maybe write it down so that when you're in a season where it feels more like a pit than a palace, maybe in those moments where you've written down the promise, that will hold you steadfast in difficult waters. But be careful who you share it with. Share it with people who are going to champion the call on your life. Don't share it with people who are going to trample all over you or try and squash that dream or have an attitude of arrogance towards you or bitterness or irritation towards you. But share it with people who can help you on that journey, fan it into flame and encourage you on your journey as you begin to step out on that plan and that promise from God. Finally, I think of King David and David had this incredible encounter where the prophet comes. Now, David at this point was out in the field. He's tending the sheep. He's just been faithful in his day-to-day -day life, tending the sheep. And the prophet Samuel comes to the house of Jesse and the prophet knows the next king of Israel is in Jesse's household. And so he comes to the household of Jesse and he says, okay, your son is gonna be the next king of Israel. And so Jesse, brought out all his big boys. His big boys were strong warriors. They're big, strong men who have been fighting in the army. And he brings them out to come before the prophet. And the prophet's going kind of down the line of all the sons. And it, each time it's no, no, no. And he gets to the end and he said, well, do you have any other sons? And then Jesse suddenly remembers. Now, how as a parent you forget a child, I will never know. But anyway, Jesse has this moment where he's like, oh, well, there's little David, but he's out on the field looking after the sheep. And so everything's held upon pause while they bring David. And so David's finally brought in from the field. And the prophet comes and, and God clearly says to, to Samuel, this is the one. And so he anoints David as the next king. But from that point until the point of David actually being the king of Israel, there's a 22 year waiting period. But I bet in that particular moment, the moment where David's just been anointed, I can only imagine him sat there thinking, oh yeah, they didn't pick my big brothers. I'm the runt of the litter, but they picked me. You know, God chose me. This amazing moment as his brothers were overlooked and God chose him. But I wonder what happened after that. You see, what happened the next day for David? Was the red carpet rolled out for him? Was there suddenly a golden throne for him to come and sit on? No, he was back out in the field, back with the sheep, tending the flock. And I wonder for David when he was back on the field and all of a sudden, today just seems very normal. And yet yesterday I was anointed as a king. What's going on? But you see, if God, if God couldn't trust um, David to look after the sheep, how could he entrust him with a nation? I think sometimes God's watching your response. Maybe the anointing is upon your life and you're thinking, why am I hidden when I've got this anointing? Or why do I feel like I'm forgotten out on the field when I've got this call on my life? If that's you today, let me encourage you to hold fast because God sees you. Just as God saw David out on the, on the field, even when his own father had forgotten him, so God sees you. Let me encourage you, send in your testimonies. I want to hear how the calls come for your life. And I want to hear what you did with it next. Did you have a season of waiting? 
Or literally, did you have a season where you had to dive straight in? Sometimes it happens where the call comes and there's an immediate response demanded from you. I think of the prophet Isaiah when the Lord comes to him of who can I send, who will go? Immediately, Isaiah says, here I am, send me. There's not kind of a, a waiting period there. It's a diving straight in, just having faith. And maybe that's what's happened to you, of maybe the call's come and now you've got to dive in and you don't know what it's going to look like. You don't know how it's all going to unfold, but you know you've just got to say yes. We've recently gone through that time ourselves where we were in Pakistan. And if I'm honest, my master plan at the moment, because we've just gone through a global pandemic, my master plan for our charity one by one was to just batten down the hatches, as it were. That's an old sailor's saying of what they used to do on their boats to ride out a storm. And that was my thought for one by one. My master plan was batten down the hatches to ride out until we're fully past the global pandemic. You know, I've already got 250 kids in my care, so just look after the kids already in my responsibility, already in my care, and just be wise. Don't take in any more new kids. Don't take on any new staff. Don't start any new big projects. But then all of a sudden, we received a phone call. We received a phone call to say a three-year-old in Pakistan had been raped and murdered, and her little body just left there on the brick factory floor. And I remember thinking in that moment, how... How can I say to her parents, well, after the pandemic's passed, then we'll help you, then we'll extend our safe house. I remember in that moment, just this urgency of you've got to do something immediately. And so overnight, we doubled our Sunday school work. We work in 24 brick factories, or were working in 24 brick factories out in Pakistan doing Sunday school. But after little three-year-old Mercy was raped, we knew we had to increase our work. And so we doubled literally overnight into 50 brick factories where we're now reaching a thousand children every single week with Sunday school. And these are kids who still today are currently trapped in slavery. But for that one hour a week, they get to be children. They can belly laugh and have fun. And more importantly, learn all about Jesus. But then through this, we've found out even more challenges with more little girls being raped and abused. And it's just horrors where, again, it's a case of, will you respond today? Will you say yes now to the call? And so even in the middle of a global pandemic, we've decided to double our safe house. We're building a second floor where we can take in another 30 girls. It's a huge step of faith for us, but it always is. When the call comes, it demands a faith that simply says yes. So where are you today? Are you in a waiting season? Or are you in a season where actually it's demanding a yes from you? Well, please email in and let me know. I'd love to share it and read your te testimonies and comments too. While you're emailing that in, let me show you a short video. And this is a video of some of our projects around the world that has come about as a response of us saying yes to the call. The King's Children's Home in Kenya came about after my season of waiting. But then our second children's home in Pakistan came about after an immediate yes to a prompting of the Holy Spirit. So watch this clip and see some of the yeses that we've stepped out in. In 2006, while serving on a mission team in Sierra Leone, Becky came across a situation that would change the course of her life forever. I met a little girl on this trip named Felicity. And after noticing she had no shoes, I knew this was a situation I could help in. I bought the shoes and was stunned by her response as she thought I had only bought the shoes in exchange for her body. This was the moment that would stick with Becky forever and ultimately would cause us to create safe spaces that vulnerable children, just like Felicity, could call home. In 2012, the first fruits of One by One came into being in the farm of King's Children's Home in Bumalabi, Kenya. 200 children currently call King's their home, and although costing £150,000 to build, the entire project was paid for up front, in cash, with no debt or mortgage. Alongside the children's home, the One by One Schools Outreach Team in Bumalabi reaches out to approximately 10,000 children every week across 18 different schools. Since the birth of the Dignity Project, almost 20,000 vulnerable girls have been reached in communities at risk of human trafficking across the world. 
With both practical and educational tools, the Dignity Project has empowered girls in Kenya, South Africa, Sierra Leone, India, Pakistan and Brazil with other countries on the horizon. In the wake of a 25-year civil war, our Hope Sri Lanka project continues to feed over 150 widows and their children every single day. As part of our project in Sri Lanka, supported career opportunities are also currently being developed to help those who have lost so much get back on their feet once again. In 2019, One by One expanded its work into Pakistan, reaching children and families trapped in bonded labour. So far, more than 50 children have been pulled out of slavery and 1,000 children every week are being reached through our Sunday School Outreach into Brick Factories. Though starting with an encounter with just one little girl, One by One has now sent over 500 unique volunteers on missions trips across the world, reaching almost every continent. And through the generous giving of our partners and friends, we've sent more than 3 million directly to the mission field. So whether it's local mission or global mission, our heart is to see believers reaching out to the lost in our world, one by one. You never regret it when you say yes to God. You know, maybe your yes can be helping us. We're taking in 30 new children this year. And maybe you can say yes by sponsoring one of our children in Pakistan. You know, the horrors that these kids go through still keeps me awake some nights. But I've also seen the power of sponsorship. I've watched my kids in Kenya who, some of them have been abandoned by their own parents. But after being sponsored, the healing that that brings to them when someone thousands of miles away has chosen them to help them. And it brings such a healing to their lives. So if you can say yes to any of our kids, please get in touch, check out the website and have a look. Also on the website, you can find a book that I recently published. This is my first ever published book, but it's full of stories of saying yes to God of following the call of God upon my life. And, the challenges that brought, but also the miracles that we've seen along the way. So if you've got a passion for missions, that's a must read for you. Well, we've had some of your questions in tonight. So thank you so much for getting in touch. It's always so lovely to hear from you. Um, so first of all, we have Steph from Utoxeter. Uh, and Steph says this, almost five years ago, I came on my first missions trip to Kenya. Uh, she came out with us to, with one by one to Kenya. And the challenge for Steph was getting on a plane because she'd not flown for 19 years and the fear almost stopped her from going out to Kenya. But she says she put her trust in God and that meant not only did she get to go on the trip, but it turned out she actually really enjoyed it and she enjoyed flying after all. And on that trip, um, she was so moved that the second year she ended up coming out with me again. She came with me to Sri Lanka and um, she says that often we go out intending to give something, but we always get far more back. And she says it's never too late to do something. Amen, Steph. That's amazing. Uh, we've also heard from Paula in Rotherham. And Paula says um, she's also recently been studying about the life of Abraham, Joseph and David. Wow. She says, I've been uh, 17 years on a similar journey to Joseph. Uh, and she too has been waiting for 17 years. And she says, I think your comment on being careful who you share the dream with is really important. She said, I was also reminded of that too. And just when you think everyone has forgot you, like the butler or the baker forgot Joseph, God reminds us that he never forgets us and he sees us. She says, his words and promises will always be fulfilled. And she's put, I think that I'm waiting for those reminders and they're really encouraging. Paula, that's so lovely. It's so good to hear from you. We've also heard from David Bridlington, and he says this. With, <laughs> he's sharing his testimony. He says, within six months of becoming a Christian, I was asked to preach, and I thought everyone just had to do it. I thought that was part of the turn. It was just one of his turns. And so he said he was asked to preach after six months of becoming a Christian, and 32 years later, he's still preaching the gospel. Uh, he said he even tried to escape it in weary times, but he couldn't. I love that. I love how God holds us to it. When we say yes to him, he will hold you to it. Uh, Chris also writes in and he's put, Chris is from Hull and he said, 
the first time I preached was in the open air in Brighton. <laughs> and he says, let's just say the seagulls gave him a hard time. I won't say exactly what he said, but the seagulls gave him a challenge in time. Uh, but he kept going. So well done, guys. That's a baptism of fire for both Dave and Chris there. But well done for keep going. Um, and then we've got Joe in Nottingham. Joe says, I felt God speak to my heart recently, but I have no idea how to begin. Where do you start in terms of stepping out? Joe, that's a great question. I think, I think the first thing to do is always pray. Pray that God would open the right doors. Prayer is never a bad place to start. I think it's the perfect place to start. And as we begin to pray, God will begin opening the right doors. I think the challenge is, just like Joseph, Joseph anticipated the doors to look a certain way. I'm pretty sure Joseph wasn't expecting the door to look like a pit or slavery or a prison. And same with David, I'm sure he pretty much thought when he's back out on the field with the sheep, oh, I've been forgotten again. But actually they were the very doors that God had put there for them to walk through. As I said before, God will spend years molding our character, shaping us so that we carry his heartbeat. You see, I think sometimes the risk is we want the call so that we can be somebody. We think, we think the call of God is about making us into a somebody. But the reality, the call of God is about simply being somebody's neighbor. It's not about you and your ego. It's just about walking in obedience to God. And when we do that, we see God's promises unfold in and through our lives. Well, I want to thank you so much for sending me your questions or your testimonies. It's always so lovely to hear from you. And let me encourage you, maybe you're still typing away, still send it in because although time's gone tonight, maybe we can address your comment or testimony next week. Now, next week, we're going to be looking at the provision of God. Often when God asks us something, there's this almost gulp moment of, I've not got the, the finances for that. I don't know how to start. How do I begin? I've got this exciting promise, but it's going to cost money and I don't have it. What happens? Well, we've watched God provide for us over the years, both in terms of finances, also in terms of open doors at the right time, in terms of relationships and volunteers. God's provided incredible and miraculous ways. So make sure you tune in next week and I'll see you then.